Good morning, everybody. Um, today, we're going to, to speak about a uh, service blu blueprint of the deployment for an IoT integration platform. So, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yes, you may want to. So, <clears throat> Kapua <clears throat> is uh, an IoT platform for building end-to-end uh, -end IoT application. It focuses on providing device management functionalities as well as uh, data management uh, collection and, uh, and storing. This slide here uh, shows the basic architecture of, of the platform, so just to introduce you to the, to the, to the main flow, of the information. Informations are collected on the field uh, from uh, from things, and then uh, they, the, the information go through uh, an IoT gateway, and they face the device connectivity layer on, on the platform. Um, the device connectivity has the responsibility to um, authenticate the connections um, and route the messages to the backend management uh, application. So, broadly speaking, we have uh, this cen center of the of, of the diagram here presents the main building blocks for managing data and, and devices. We have a device registry that maintains basically the, the information related to the connected devices. We have a device, device management uh, functionality that allows to operate remotely on the devices in the field by, for example, deploying software packages into the device, by running uh, schedule operations on the device, such kind of things. There's a, um, um, a device management layer which operates with the um, device management protocol. We have an integration with Cura, of course, and we would like to have also integrations with other device management protocols, such as, for example, like the time to m And uh, the other big piece is the data ingestion, data ingestion uh, block, which basically accepts the data, stores the data into a uh, NoSQL database, in this case, which is Elasticsearch and also provides uh, functionality to search this data and for uh, viewing and browsing it in, in, the, in the web console through the REST API or even retrieve that data and build dashboards on, on top of it and such kind of things. Around these core blocks there are applications for managing through a web console or for integrating upstream applications or enterprise applications such as uh, through the REST API. So basically, every functionality in the platform is also available, uh, accessible programmatically through the REST API. So, <clears throat> um, so let's go through the basic functionalities that we are, we are providing in the, in the platform. So we have uh, the well, we structured, from the code point of view, we structured the, 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 the platform into several um, building blocks. We call them core IoT services. We have an account, uh, an account service which basically manages, the, it is the, the tenant management. The, the application is, the platform is multi-tenant, this service here manages the, uh, the tenants. Then we have identity management service basically managing uh, users and identities inside the, inside the platform. We have an authentication and authorization service which, also, which is basically a set of sub-functionalities, identity validation, credentials, permissions, permission checking, roles and resource groups. The device registry as well has several, several sub-functionalities built inside, in, in, inside it. It is, of course, a device registry, but it also manages device lifecycle. Um, it also have, uh, device, tracks the device connections coming from outside, and it also um, gives you kind of a log of the device events happening uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the connected part of the, of the system. 
Device management in turn has several, uh, has several functionalities already built. It's application configuration. You can set parameters on the device in the field. You can remotely execute commands. You can start and stop bundles in the CURA, uh, in the CURA use case. You can even read or write assets and uh, asset channels functionality that we briefly uh, saw during the, 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 the other talk, the, the talk before. Then we can also install device the, the, the deployment packages so we can update the software on, on, the, on the device. And, oh, sorry, and we can execute uh, generic request response uh, on the device on the field. Data store has a client that uh, uh, gives you um, um, in indexing of some kind of information to uh, in um, make the retrieval of information easier. So you have a client registry, basically the registry of all the device devices that have published some data into the data store. The channels where the, the data have been published and the metrics, but also gives you the whole message uh, that uh, was sent to the to the platform. So you can re retrieve store and retrieve messages from the data store. Uh, we have a scheduler, a scheduler uh, service that allows to define scheduled tasks, generic scheduled tasks. One of those tasks are the device jobs. So basically, we can define a job for executing a specific operation on a set of the devices. Despite on the variety of these functionalities, all the services conform to a blueprint. So here I try to give you uh, an idea on how the, uh, this uh, IoT core services are internally structured. We follow the very strict discipline to to structure every every service in the platform in that way, so then we can then develop the platform into the future uh, with the future architectural change that we're going to, to tell at the, at the end of, of the talk. So basically, a service defines a bounded context. A service is, in this case, is the device registry, which which has four sub uh, or component services inside. So a service defines a bounded context. All intera interactions between services um, are handled through the Kapua service interfaces. Each service can manage resources, but there's no sharing of resources between services. So the device registry service in general does not share database resources or connections or whatever with the authentication and authorization service or with the device management service. This gives us a, a, a lot of decouplement between, between services. Um, each capable service exposes an interface and an object model that confirms to a service blueprint that we define. It's an, it's an interface defined define in, in the platform. Uh, each service exposes objects and object model objects, of course, and these model objects are all serializable as JSON or, or XML. Each Kapoor service can handle, persist, can handle persistent entities, and the services can also rise or handle events um, raised by other services. This allows to we basically build a choreography. Uh, approach for managing global status changes. This gives us a lot of flexibility in in how uh, services interact each other. Um, again, each each service also supports per tenant scope configuration, so we can have a system conf system wide configuration as well as a per tenant configuration on some applications. And this scope of configuration is available as kind of a platform service because we basically also provide a Kapua Commons layer that basically it's a Calper library that if you want you can use to implement services and reduces a lot the, bump, the, the burden of implementing a service. So <clears throat> at the end what we provide with for, for, for a deployment is uh, a packaging of all these modules into 
these four basically four applications. So this is the default, the current default deployment for um, a Kapua for a Kapua um, setup, uh, setup environment. So we have an administration console with all basically all the services inside. It runs it is it runs on Jetty and it is a Docker. It runs as a Docker. Then we have the API gateway uh, again with a bunch of these services embedded into the uh, into the web application and the device broker, which basically manages the connections with the outside world. We added the service event broker. Uh, which is based on Artemis, which is based on Artemis broker, and it basically allows the uh, choreography um, of uh, the services and of, of the events generated by the services. On the back end, we also have um, a data tier, which is <coughs> built on, on two different comp components. We have a NoSQL data store, uh, which runs on Elasticsearch. Uh, well, it's very, uh, I guess, it's very easy to to search and and query information on Elasticsearch. It basically offers a, a, a document data store. Documents are basically JSON, so it's very easy to 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 integrate with it. It also offers a, um, a REST API to access it directly. We will build something upon on this component also in the future to ease the to easy the, the access of uh, of the information for for the, 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 the tenants in the platform. And it also provides an SQL persistency layer which is now defaulted on H2. Um, we also build already built in uh, we also have a data migration, migration functionality built into the system. So basically the schema of the database is described as an XML, so we can, it can be easily converted to a schema, um, SQL uh, schema definitions in whatever database uh, dial, uh, SQL dialect that you want to, to use. For example, MariaDB, Postgre, or whatever. On the console and the API gateway also provided, we worked on modularization of this application, so now in the current 030 release, there's also extension points for adding more UI functionalities for the administration console or for adding more um, in REST API resources. So, this is the default deployment, deployment now. Now I just go briefly through the integration points that this, this deployment provides. We already talked about the REST APIs. We have message routes in the, in the system, so we are using Camel behind the scenes, so we can route messages uh, to a wide range, of, wide, wide range of destinations. We have the event bus. Event bus is used internally to maintain global changes in, in the status of the platform, but can be also will be also used by external application if they want to, for example, receive not notifications from the platform. And we also provide um, authentication via open ID. So if there's a, an open ID service provider, this can be uh, connected to the platform out of the box. So I guess the, the now uh, Jens will show you how this deployment, uh, standard deployment, can fit into, um, uh, I, would, I would say, DevOps world. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is the correct one? Yeah. yeah. So, um, one short question, who knows about Kubernetes? Who knows about Docker? Okay. <laughs> So, um, play out hardware, um, what was it? Um, you had a server, you install, you format your disk, you install your operating system, you start deploying your stuff. Um, then you come at a certain point where you want uh, to scale up. Uh, so you simply unbox the next server, you format your hard drive, you install your operating system, and you're good to go. Um, 
problem is not only uh, unboxing the server, it's probably um, buying a server, getting approval for that. That can take time. So probably doing that, uh, people came up with the idea of virtualization. Uh, so you buy a big server, you slice it into different pieces, um, and then you can like provision some, some virtual servers in there and um, assign resources as you see fit for, for your project. Um, so what that brings along is you can see those different layers and, and all these this different um, technologies um, adds one layer on top of that. So basically what you have, you have, uh, as you know, hardware, kernel, operating system, then there's actually some layer missing in here, which is like, depending if you have like full hardware virtualization, you have virtual hardware in there, or power virtualization, and this is a bit thinner. Um, but then again, you have in the virtual machine, you have the next kernel, next operating system, your environment, which could be, I don't know, Java virtual machine, uh, a JBoss server, um, and then finally you have your application in there. Now, what Docker is about, and for those of you who, who raised their hands uh, knowing about Docker, um, that, that's no uh, big news. Um, it's lagging. Yeah. That works. Um, so, th that is what, what containers and, and, and Docker does. Um, so, instead of like, like replicating all this hardware and this full virtualization, um, you just stuff like, like a smaller box with less layers um, in, that, in that scheme of uh, splitting up resources, the, the big server, splitting up the big server into smaller chunks, um, and you only focus on what you actually need. Um, so, most of your application environment and the small or S layer, uh, without having a kernel, uh, without having virtual hardware. Um, so just focus on, on what you actually need. Now the neat thing with Docker is um, you can assemble your container using layers. So you, for example, start you know, with the operating system, you get some, some uh, CentOS layer uh, from Docker Hub, if you like that. Um, you add your Java virtual machine on top of that, you add your, your next layer next, and finally you add your application to that. Um, which gives you like a template, um, which you have as a binary uh, stored in, in your local registry, for example, or if you want on, on Docker Hub. Um, and you have one template which you can instantiate multiple times. So you, you can start this, the same container, it's exactly the same container multiple times um, <coughs> on different machines, of course, uh, or on the same machine here. Now, one thing, if you want to start thinking about scaling up, um, you need a way to, to orchestrate that. So, running one Docker on a local machine, that's fine. Um, but if you want to, to, to scale out on, I don't know, different data centers, uh, on, on, on different machines, you need more power, uh, you need something like uh, Kubernetes or OpenShift, which is based on Kubernetes, um, to, to orchestrate that. So, have uh, a master machine or some, some master instance controlling, controlling that. You have different worker nodes. Uh, and then those workloads get scheduled on those nodes. So um, if you have, for example, a web UI uh, that gets scheduled on one node, now you have a high demand, you can scale up to different nodes. And of course, down there you have a router, which like, allows you access from the external side. So of course you want your, your application accessible from the outside and that, that's up to some degree. And um, this is where the router kicks in where it directs requests to the actual worker node which is hosting your service. So there's some, some sort of um, uh, routing there um, to do that. Now, looking at Capo, where this, does that fit in Capo? So what we just saw, these different stacks, these different Docker containers, um, they can already be scheduled um, in, the, in the current Capo version on, on OpenShift. So uh, you can just schedule that, uh, run it on different nodes, scale it up. Uh, and the router will take care of mapping uh, the, the inbound connections uh, to those different worker nodes. Um, the thing is, now, the next step, where we're making those um, services smaller, so you have, again, um, those different services with the, with the small environment, which, I don't know, can be a broker, so broker component, web component, um, and you just have those small services scheduled uh, by the master node, um, assigning this to different worker nodes, scaling up as the system requires it at, at that moment of time. Um, if you now think back of, of the picture with the, with the server, which you unbox and you install manually, that wouldn't be possible. 
because that's just too much um, of, of, of a hassle uh, setting up all different um, different instances. But having this technology, um, you can split up your, your application in different small pieces uh, and actually scale those pieces up as you like. I think this is the moment to hand back to Stefano. Yeah. So <clears throat> we 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 tried to figure out how it could uh, why how a microservice deployment for a Kapua platform could uh, look like. So if you remember the slide before where we had that uh, silo applications for the web console, the REST API, and the broker and so on. How can we break these pieces down into smaller pieces that can uh, run on their own uh, microservice? So the feature, the broad feature, is could, could be this one that it's now projected. So basically, uh, all these components still are, are still docker, dockers. They can be managed through uh, OpenShift or Kubernetes, but as you can see, uh, each application, each single application is, is much more, smaller. Because Why? Because the, the modules that before were stuck, embedded into one single application, now they are decomposed in several, several services. So the idea we still have, the, 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 the front ends, are still the same. We have a, an administration console, an REST API, a device broker, and a service events broker. Um, but now, they don't embed the, the modules inside their own virtual machine, but they interact with services on the back end. Of course, there's a need to discover where the ser these services are, so we need a a new layer in the middle, which is the service discovery part. So when, uh, for example, the administration console invokes uh, a piece of code that needs to uh, interact with uh, uh, the authentication service or the account or the device management, it also has to discover where this service is. So all the services have to register into this discovery service and advertise the, that they can receive, um, they can receive information, um, their requests, and so well, the administration console or the REST API uses a locator pattern to uh, decouple the the client code from the implementation of this service discovery or service discovery part. So the client code remains kind of agnostic of where the device is which kind of discovery service should I use? What is the, the protocol to let uh, um, 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 a microservice interact with the other microservice? It could be HTTP, it could be something else. That's why I uh, use that microservice endpoint label in those green boxes. Should we use HTTP? Should we use messaging for remote uh, invocation of, of services? Should we, should we use a pure asynchronous message, um, message pattern? That is something that is, is going to be discussed in, in the community. Um, and yeah, but the, the, the interesting point that whichever the, 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 the communication technology is we can use we can use the same the same architecture so I created this slide here to um, try to give um, insight on uh, how this from from an architectural point of view how we can manage to 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 um, reach this uh, microservitization of, of Kapua. Uh, one, point, one good point is that Kapua is already modular. We, we saw in the, in the slides before that um, um, each module is, uh, um, conforms to a blueprint. It is independent or decoupled for, from the other module. So there is uh, some more steps that we need to 
evolve this uh, initial this initial modularization of Kapua into something that becomes a microservice. So the idea is when uh, the service B in this case comes up, it has to um, register or advertise its services to a discovery layer. Okay. Once it advertises this, this the, the, the hits availability, another service in, in the network of microservices can discover it by querying the, the service discovery layer, obtain the uh, endpoint uh, where the service can be uh, can be invoked. Okay. So just one minute and. Who is responsible for doing for doing this uh, this discovery? It's the the locator. The locator is the one that that receives. Um, if you look at the at the blue box on the top on the top left uh, top left part of the of the slide, um, locator uh, um, the, the the service body requires uh, the locator to give a reference. Of, of the service of, of the of the service B of the yeah the service B so the locator goes to the discovery service service finds searches for an entry of service B retrieves the entry finds the endpoint create a kind of a service B B wrapper or we can call it uh, service B proxy I uh, use wrapper because proxy uh, can be mm, mm, um, Specific technology for, for some for, for some for, for some framework. So the locator gives a kind of a service B wrapper. The service A uses the wrapper to access the functionalities in the service B. So everything in the in the in the implementation of service A does nothing regarding uh, the specific technology used for interaction or even for the service discovery. Everything is wrapped and this gives the, it's a big simplification because the client code is agnostic about this technology layer, so the implement, implementation is also easier because you cannot, you should not have to deal with this kind of details. And your, the client code is also agnostic of the protocol used to communicate. With this schema here, all the uh, wrap-up or setup of the microservice layer is um, delegated outside of the service implementation, and actually the service implementation should all, should have just a very minimal, uh, just few assumptions on the container model, so where the, the service itself is deployed in. So that's basically the idea around it. There's a discussion ongoing on this part. We have a uh, birth of feather this evening for Kapua. So if you want to join the discussion, uh, um, you're welcome. Oh, sorry. Um, another, well, this, I want just to spend a couple of more words on a couple of more words on, on service events because service events is also another part of the microservice story because it allows different uh, different microservices to interact but with a different uh, with a different pattern so we, we can exchange uh, messages the point here is that uh, we're not we're going through an event an event bus broker so when an, um, when a a method is in, is invoked on on the service A, for example. Let's say we are deleting a tenant, for example. The the method itself, through a, um, an interceptor, writes an event that can be listened by other services. So if I if I delete um, a tenant, I I also want to delete all the resources owned by ten, by this tenant. So I want to delete the users. I want to delete the devices. I want to delete everything related to it, maybe even the, the data. But we don't want to the service A to know each one of the downstream services that has to be notified by this event. So this event service stuff allows to keep 
uh, and high level of, of decoupling between, between microservices. And this is going to be available in, in Kapua 1.0, so for the end of this year. So the way we implemented it, we're using uh, JMS 2.0 and we're using um, uh, sh shared um, uh, shared durable shared sorry durable shared sub subscriptions and together with the together uh, with the, the uh, uh, um, event data store that the uh, event store that we have built for each microservice this allows the whole system to be eventually consistent that is very important because if you want for example to delete something that has then downstream delete something else that has to delete something else again and you cannot rely on a transaction you have to guarantee that the global system at the end is eventually consistent so to guarantee this eventually consistency you need to be sure that the events are fired at, at least once that you don't miss any event that is re relevant, relevant for your system and that's how we build this functionality and uh, so this a lot of frameworks provide an, an event bus, but some usually, often, they are not eventually consistent, they're just best effort. But with this approach, we can be eventually consistent, which is very important. Integration with other IoT projects. Of course, we want to uh, go move further with, with the messaging stuff, so an uh, uh, important point of integration is Honor as a messaging layer. For the device protocols, we already support Cura. We want to support more with, the, with, the, with other functionalities Cura will implement, but we'll also look at Lishan as device management protocol. And for software updates, Eclipse Opbit, and for the digital twins, Eclipse Vito. So, as I said, we have a birth of feather this evening, so if you are interested in discussing this kind of very architectural or uh, deep diving into the, into the Kapua stuff, uh, you're welcome. And... Oops. Your deck has a booth, if you want to visit us, you're welcome again. And don't forget to... Right? Yeah. That's, that's all. Any questions for Stefano and Jens? You, um, have you thought about high availability solving it this way? That you have the same servers available a number of times for high availability? High availability. High. High. Well, uh, so, so if you look at, at the Kubernetes OpenShift, um, if that's, that's called pods, so you have pods which is an instance of, of containers. So if you kill that pod, by accident, on purpose, or by hardware failure, it will be rescheduled automatically. So, uh, of course, all the data which is persistent, so there, there's no persistence in that part. So you need a persistence layer at, at some different location, you need persistent storage, and there's a concept for that as well. Uh, of course, all the data in the part is lost, but that's also the concept. Um, so you, you need a different persistent storage, there's a concept for that, and then a new part will spin up and will continue at, at that point. And then the second question is about the scalability. I mean, Kubernetes basically allows you to spin up more Docker containers, if you try. Yeah. Is it also in this? Yeah. Yeah, so, so there's, there's something like auto-scaling, for example, where you can define different different uh, factors uh, where you want to spin up new nodes. Uh, there's a metric system in OpenShift where you can, for example, take from, from Kapo, from the Kapo web console or API com, uh, container, you can take the number of requests per second, and when that reach a uh, threshold, you can scale on the next container, you can, can all define all those rules here. So we'll take one more question and then do a short coffee break. Uh, we like we have a packed agenda, so I think you are first. Okay. Um, the uh, service events, um, from the perspective of the uh, service firing event, uh, are they um, uh, asynchronous? So does the uh, firing all return immediately? Yeah, they are fired instantly when uh, the, the, the method is executed and the event is fired. Um, actually, an event is fired, and a copy of, an ev of the event is stored in the event store, 
and if something goes wrong, we are able to pick up it again and refile. Okay, so there is persistence involved, so in, yeah. in order to ensure that you never lose the file. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you.